Okay, we're at 10 to, so I'm going to kick off. Um, thank you everyone for coming. This is a, a bigger crowd than I'm used to dealing with, so this should be interesting. Uh, my name's Stephen Finucan. I'm a software developer working for Red Hat. Um, I primarily focus on NFE, SDNE kind of stuff. So uh, anything to do with CPU pinning and numeracy stuff, that's my kind of problem domain. Today I'm going to be talking about a new feature that's been introduced in Nova in the last cycle, the Rocky cycle, called NumaWare vSwitches. And because of the attendance or the crowd that's here, I'm also going to focus on some kind of like real similar features in the same area that I think people should be aware of. I'm coming from a development perspective or background, but this talk is mostly focused towards the um, actual deployment and usage side of things. I won't go into too much detail about any, how any of these things actually work under the hood, but I'll leave time at the end for questions, and if anyone wants to, wants to catch me afterwards, you can do so. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. So the agenda for today, I'm going to give a quick overview of what NUMA is. Again, very high level. There's no point. I won't go into too much detail about it just so you can understand the kind of problems it can cause for deployments and why we need to come up with solutions like NumaWare vSwitches to work around them. I'm going to go through the actual NumaWare vSwitches problem itself and a couple of the approaches we tried before finally talking about the actual solution that we settled on. After that, I'm going to go through some common questions that people have asked me on this over the last couple of months. And then that bonus section, I'm going to cover some related features that I think people should care about, and then a wrap up in questions. So start, starting from the top, what is NUMA? So it stands for non-uniform memory architecture, and it's a computer uh, processor architecture that's uh, seen common adoption uh, on platforms in the last decade or two. Pretty much if you have a modern server with multiple CPU multiple physical packages, you're going to be dealing with NUMA unless you've explicitly disabled it. From a graphical perspective, this is essentially what it looks like. You have at least two nodes and processes running on one node, be it a physical socket or a die within two or within the same package. Uh, memory accesses from that to memory associated with that node are as fast as you'd expect. If they want to access memory associated with another node, then you incur a performance penalty. And that performance penalty can vary, but 50% um, can be quite common for something like this vSwitches issue. If you're talking about multiple circuits, uh, this has changed with Intel processors over the last year. It's more of a mesh topology now, but um, jumping between different NUMA nodes, it can have an increasingly the negative effects on your performance. So naturally, what you want to do for almost any process where on a platform where NUMA is enabled is you want to make sure that memory accesses, where possible, uh, are local to the node. So you're not having to jump across these links. And this doesn't just affect your processes. It also affects anything on your host that consumes memory. So that includes PCI devices. Uh, so things like NICs, uh, because they have this, this same issue, if you have a um, PCI NIC and it will be associated with a given NUMA node, and if you have processes running on different NUMA nodes, you're going to get those performance hits. So when we talk about the, the kind of networking that's available, uh, there's Three, there's a load more because networking is weird and special. But the three that most people will spend their time talking about would be the kernel of vhost or legacy vert IO, user space vhost, which is generally typified by things like DPDK vSwitch, and then SRIOV. So each of these comes with their own pros and cons. I've listed kind of flexibility versus performance, but there's a lot more that has to be taken into consideration. Um, including cost and things like this. The main comparison, uh, or the most useful comparison here is between user space, vhost, and SRIOV, because these would be the most likely ones you'd see in a deployment, uh, an SDN, NFE, 
based deployment. So if we have a look at, uh, let's say this diagram, two VNFs, uh, you've got two physical networks, and then you're going to have traffic going between the VNFs and the physical networks plus some management stuff which we're going to forget about. Because we have this NUMA topology thing that we need to be concerned about, that previous diagram ends up looking something more like this. So unless you've specifically said otherwise, each VNF and instance is going to be running on, um, it's going to be isolated to a single host NUMA node. And what you don't want happening is you don't want your VNF running on a different uh, NUMA node to uh, where your NIC is, where all the traffic is ingressing and egressing from the host. Naturally, you want to co-locate those stuff on the same NUMA node. And for something like uh, SRIOV, this is pretty easy to do because Nova, since it included or uh, added support for SRIOV and PCI pass through, has taken NUMA topologies into account. There's actually an uncomfortably tight coupling between NUMA and things like CPU pinning, which I'm going to talk about later. We're trying to separate that going forward. But if you boot an instance with SRIOV um, interfaces, you will get NUMA affinity. It won't let you boot that instance unless you don't, you can get that new affinity. But that's not the case for uh, something like OVS because Nova doesn't have that view into what NICs your chosen vSwitch platform is actually using. Uh, and obviously, I'm going to go into this now, but we don't want to go and have to teach Nova how to do all of this stuff because Nova cares about compute. It doesn't care so much about networking. So how we attacked this problem and came up with a solution. The solution that we landed on obviously wasn't what we arrived at day one. This was built up iteratively by looking at um, various different choices that we had. Starting off, we're talking about vSwitches. Nova should, doesn't need to know about networking. Therefore, the simple answer would have been, well, we can let Neutron do all of this for us. Uh, the issue with this is that you need to think about what Nova is aware of and what Neutron is aware of. So Nova knows things about compute resources, so basically um, what kind of basic resources you have available to you, whether you're using Live or QMU, just raw QMU, that kind of thing. It also knows things like pneumatology because it has that um, introspection through the LiveBird API or the Zen API. API uh, and so forth, and Neutron doesn't know any of this stuff. And just as we don't want Nova to start learning how to inspect OVS, we don't want to have to teach Neutron how to inspect Libvert and Zen and Hyper-V and whatever other, your, whatever your chosen hypervisor is. Placement is um, kind of it seems like the savior for pretty much every problem that OpenStack, at least in the Nova and Cyborg and Neutron sphere, the savior for pretty much every problem we have. The problem with placement was at the time that we were working on this and even now, the, the features that we needed placement didn't support them. So we could have waited three or four cycles for these features to land in placement, but even then this placement has been in development for quite a long time and 50% of a performance hit is quite a substantial performance hit. And we at Red Hat were trying to support these custom hacky workarounds that involved restarting services and stuff, and we didn't want to do that. So essentially, placement wasn't a viable solution for us at the time. Nova, again, this comparison of what Nova knows and Neutron knows. The biggest issue is that Nova doesn't know how to introspect and pull out information from OVS. And therefore, and we didn't want to teach it this stuff, but we thought about this for a little bit longer and we realized that actually there wasn't any real reason to go and do this introspection. We were able to work around this. So we assessed on Nova as the solution, but with some caveats, which I'm gonna explore now. So when you're trying to categorize neutron networks, there's two primary ways that they, um, if you go through the neutron documentation, that you'll see them categorized. 
The first is something like provider and tenant networks. There's a load of other stuff. I found it quite interesting when I was working on this that I was talking to neutron cores and asking them questions. And before long, I started getting back, we don't know, as an answer, which was quite interesting. So provider networks versus tenant networks, it's a very kind of neutron-y thing. It's more to do with um, who can configure, who's doing the configuration of networks um, and what the underlying topology is. It meshes a load of stuff together, but it didn't re really apply to this. Pre-created networking and self-servicing networking again didn't quite map up to what we wanted. What we actually wanted to know was um, whether a network was an L2 network, used something like a FizzNet, or whether it was an L3 network. And the reason for that is because whether it's an L2 network or whether it's an L3 network determines um, how many NICs uh, your network is allowed to use and how they're configured and accessed. So if we look at the sample configuration, this is from um, one of the uh, configuration files for Neutron. If you're using the uh, ML2 OVS plugin, this configuration option maps an OVS bridge, which I guess you consider like your primitive, to a Neutron FizzNet tag. So it says if you have traffic going through this FizzNet, this is where it should get tunneled in and out of. From the Nova side of things, we introduced uh, a new configuration option and dynamic groups. And what the configuration option let you do is you said what FizzNets were available or accessible on your host. And then a plain old, this is what NUMA nodes that this FizzNet maps to, this is what NUMA node this FizzNet maps to, and so forth. Um, the advantage of this approach is we didn't need to teach Nova how to do that neutron inspection. I didn't need to learn to, how to go and use the OVS DB APIs and import a load of code from Neutron or redevelop code. And uh, any deployment tool worth, worth its salt is that's doing the configuration of these networks anyway. So that already knows all this information about um, what NICs you have on your host and is able to introspect and find out like what the NUMA node is and stuff. So this moves it from uh, something that has to happen at runtime to something that you can conf configure as part of your deployment tooling. Uh, an interesting point that came up uh, during this is in real productions, most people tend to use um, NIC bonding to make sure that they have um, like ac active passive failover and fancy networking stuff. So we uh, made sure that this Numinos configuration option was able to be a list. So if you had multiple NICs connected and for some reason you decided you wanted to place them on different Numa nodes for whatever, um, you would be able to do that without uh, you would be able to do that. Without this uh, option, you wouldn't be able to do that. L3 networks are a little bit different. So where with L2 networks, you can then be, they'd be typified with having multiple FizzNets on a host. Um, L3 networks, they all have to go through the same endpoint. So you, you configure your endpoint IP. You can use multiple actual interfaces, but they'll have to be bonded together. So that made the configuration Again, this is an example from like the ML2 OVS plugin. That meant the configuration from a Nova perspective is, um, is actually a lot simpler for the tunnel side of things. And again, we we're aware that people do bonding and they can also spread this over multiple um, Numinos, so we made this a list. And that's pretty much Numa aware vSwitches. It's not overly complicated. And uh, like in tests that we've seen, Without this feature, like I said, up to 50% of a performance hit was possible in the situation where you had that diagram that they've been in where a workload was running on one Numa node and your NIC was located on a different Numa node. So everything was going across uh, that bus. Uh, this eliminates that basically as, a, as an issue, as a realistic issue. From the deployment side of things, um, I know that the version of Triple O or deploy, like the OSP deployment tool, that 
supports this configuration manually in OSB 14, and the plan is to make sure that the deployment tool will just do it for you uh, without need to worry about it in OSP 15 and 16 and so forth. So a couple of the common questions that I've been asked about this is A, why is it so manual? Um, it, does, it is a pretty low tech solution given the solutions that had been proposed. The reason for that is going back, deployment tooling knows all this information already. Uh, we didn't feel that there was a need to introduce um, a whole load of additional complexity into either Nova or Neutron and teach those systems about things that they previously didn't know about. Placement, you can automate all of this, and we're exploring doing that in Triple O going forward. And placement was explored and it was looked at in great detail. We made the determination that it wasn't quite ready for this, but going forward, uh, we will probably be exploring moving this to placement. Uh, I would recommend there's a really interesting talk happening later this week. It's a demo for the bandwidth aware scheduling. All of that uses placement, and I, if anyone here, especially the more technical uh, focused people, is interested in this stuff, I would highly recommend going to that. So outside of NumaWare vSwitches, there's been a couple of other uh, changes that have happened in recent cycles all focus on improving the performance or the determinism of um, instances with an NFE focus. The first of these is uh, a thing called configurable TXRX queue sizes. In short, um, if you have an instance running uh, and something on the host or within the instance preempts your standard workload and you have traffic flooding into that instance, that stop where it gets preempted um, and work happens on something else before it returns to your main workload. You have queues and those queues can fill up pretty damn fast, which results in drop packets. Uh, from talking to architects, drop packets seems to be like the worst thing that could ever happen. Uh, the solution to this is simply to make queues bigger. Uh, more in all the testing that Red Hat have done and various other companies have done, jumping from the default, which was 256 up to 1,024, was seen as sufficient to get the performance that they were, uh, they were demanding. But this is configurable because we're expecting people, like we've moved from 10, G, like 10 gig to 40 gig, and 100 gig is already, I guess, in production, and who knows where it's going to go after that. This is available in Rocky, and a sample configuration uh, is provided there. Uh, another one, this is more uh, useful for people that be thinking about real-time uh, workloads. So if you are running an emulator, the emulator or a hypervisor, the hypervisor itself has to do a certain amount of work whether that's um, basic I.O. or just kind of like clean up tasks. And these can steal resources from CPUs. And if your CPUs, your vCPUs are running uh, real-time workloads, you don't want anything else stomping on them. So the solution to this, the initial solution at least, was to assign a dedicated core for each instance that all of this overhead stuff could get thrown onto and keep it away from your main workload cores. This was introduced in Akata, but in Rocky we've built upon this uh, so that instead of having a single core per instance, you have, multi you have a pool of cores and all your workload is, all those overhead tasks are all pooled on this pool of cores. Sample of how you configure the former and a sample of how you configure the latter from the command line. Uh, and for the latter, there's also some Nova conf configuration necessary. And then the last one, which is, uh, this is still under development at the moment. I said earlier on that we have this unfortunate thing in Nova where NUMA and things like CPU pinning have been really closely coupled for not very good reasons. We are moving uh, things like bandwidth aware scheduling, we're, that's all happening in placement. We've moved vCPUs, memory, disk, all of that stuff into placement. 
The next step in this, uh, it, from the NFE perspective, is to start tracking PCPUs as well as vCPUs. So we're expecting this work to be completed in Stein and from the user side of things, this will have two implications. The first is that the days of having to split your cloud into hosts that will run dedicated instances with pin CPUs and hosts that will run um, non-dedicated instances, normal shared floating CPUs, that won't have to happen anymore because they'll be able to coexist on the same host. The other thing is that you'll be able to mix um, those pinned cores with the non-pinned cores within the same instance. So you'll be able to say, well, I've got eight cores in my host, I want six of them to be pinned, and then I want two that are just gonna be doing OS, internal OS overhead stuff that don't need to be pinned, they can float. And we're gonna do all of this through tracking the displacement. It's not completed yet, but this is roughly what it's gonna look like. Anyone that's worked with placement before should recognize these kind of commands. And we're gonna be, um, this will all be exposed via Nova Conf configuration. And the last one, uh, this is my, the personal bane of my life because of the amount of times I've had to support issues around this. Live migration with ish, uh, for instances with a NUMA topology or CPU pinning at the moment is completely and utterly broken and it has been broken since it was implemented. There's some workarounds that people will do. Um, more experienced operators will have their own little bag of tricks that they'll use but the fact remains that it doesn't work out of the box and it should. The solution to this is to fix it. Uh, the technical details of how we're gonna go about fixing that would take a session by themselves, but this is uh, in the pipeline for this cycle. So to quickly recap what I've kind of covered today before I move on to Q&A. Uh, firstly, not accounting for NUMA can have um, tremendously bad uh, impacts on your performance uh, and therefore you should account for it. Numeraware vSwitches have been introduced in Rocky. This closes one of the uh, issues that we, remaining open issues we had around Numa and Numa awareness. Uh, this is based on uh, a Nova configuration config and we think of it as mostly a deployment issue. Future versions of Triple O and I guess other deployment tools will make this um, configuration almost automatic. We will be looking at moving this into placement uh, in the long term, but I envision that being three or four cycles, so that'd be about two years down the road before we're in a situation to do that. Until then, this is the way to go about doing that. And there are a whole load of other features that have been released in the last cycle or two that uh, I would highly recommend anyone working in this area uh, focus on and in, uh, look into. And with that, that is a 10,000 feet view of Numero V switches. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free uh, now or after the talk. And thanks for listening. That's the question. Uh, is, uh, I mean, as you mentioned, that some of the features landed on Rocky and some landed on Akata. Uh, is uh, OSP director uh, upgrade uh, takes care when you upgrade from the earlier version to the version you do support uh, the configuration automatically, or that need to be done manually and once it uh, integrated uh, with Iraqi from that point on is uh, upgrade both uh, one version upgrade as well as fast forward upgrade handles it. So my, my understanding of this is it depends on the, the feature you're talking about. So Triple O will handle migration of, so if you have a feature that existed in one release and it changed to another in another release, then it'll handle the migration between the two of those. But in terms of when you're adding additional features, it doesn't tend to tweak any knobs around that. Specifically the, you know, the NUMA configuration which were introduced. Yeah, no, it wouldn't turn that stuff on by default. Um, 
that would be, I'm not sure how you'd actually go about doing that, but it would be, an operator would need to supply uh, input to say this is something that needs to be switched on now. We wouldn't do it by default in case we broke something, somebody didn't want it. Any other questions? If not, I can run away. Um, thank you very much for listening and enjoy the rest of your summer.